Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Monica, Marketing Assistant at Tonatech. We're excited to have you here today. I would like to introduce to you our presenter, Cole Rigney, US Regional Sales Manager. Please leave your questions in the Q&A tab, not in the chat. Um, after the presentation is over, we'll answer as many questions as we can. Now let's get started. All right, well, welcome to Fire Pump Controllers 101. I'm gonna get started with the presentation now. So in this presentation, we're gonna talk about the codes and standards that are applicable to uh, control panel manufacturing. And this is gonna be uh, general across the board for all fire pump controller uh, manufacturers. There's gonna be a couple things that are a little bit different for Tornatech uh, along the way, uh, the way that we do it. Uh, but this uh, in general is gonna be for all fire pump controller uh, manufacturers. So we're gonna look at codes and standards. We're gonna look at the listing and approval agencies. Uh, we'll talk about general information on electrics uh, and diesels. And then we'll briefly talk about the jockey panels as well. So to get started with the codes and standards, NFPA is the one that uh, we adhere to. Uh, NFPA 20 is, is the primary one. I'm sure most people are familiar with NFPA. They write the standards for fire pump control panels, and that is what we adhere to. Uh, the ones that are most pertinent to fire pump control panels is going to be Chapter 10, which is on electrics, and Chapter 12, which is for diesels. Uh, one of the other standards and uh, the codes that we're looking at here is the NEC, uh, National Electric Code. It's actually the same as NFPA 70. Um, the latest edition for this one is from 2014, and we're just looking at section 695 where it talks about the fire pumps uh, as well as fire pump control panels. Um, so the, uh, the approval agencies, listing and approval agencies, we're gonna have UL. UL issues what is uh, called a listing. So all of our control panels are built uh, first to the NFPA 20 standard, and then we have to have that uh, looked at by UL, and uh, they have to give us their okay. They give us the UL listing, uh, which is required for fire. They're headquartered in Northbrook, Illinois, um, and you can see there the scope of business is the protection of life and property, uh, and that comes up several times throughout this presentation, um, and then issues listings in regards to equipment built to the NFPA 20 standard. Uh, the other one that is crucial for fire pump controller uh, manufacturing is going to be uh, FM. So FM Global, headquartered in Boston, Massachusetts, you can see their scope of business is also the same as UL. It says the protection of life and property. Um, and then they issue what's called approval. So you have the UL listing and then you have the FM approval. Again, built to the NFPA 20 standard. Um, some more general information, uh, fire pump controllers serve to protect life and property and not the equipment it controls. So basically what that is saying is that these are uh, the, the fire pump panel, the fire pump, uh, and the equipment that's associated with those two items, uh, the whole sprinkler system is going to be, uh, it, it's going to be set to put out fires and prevent uh, life lost and uh, damage to property. It's not there to protect itself. So when you have uh, an active fire, the control panel is gonna keep the pump running until either the fire is out and somebody goes and stops the panel, hits the stop button manually, or uh, the equipment, it'll go until failure. So it's not ever going to protect itself. Um, and it's actually, not allowed per the code to do that. So you can see some examples of devices that people might want to put on here to protect the proper, or to protect the device, the, the equipment, uh, like an overload, low oil pressure, high temperature, low suction pressure. None of those things are actually allowed to stop the pump. So we have to go until failure because we're trying to put out the fire. So protect life and property, that is the primary focus. However, there are a couple things that uh, we are able to stop on. So there's a, a, a two caveats here to the uh, not ever being able to stop it. And one of them for electrics is going to be locked rotor. Um, when you start up a control panel, uh, when you start up a pump, the control panel is going to have uh, a large amount of amps right off the bat. The motor is going to have a, a spike in amps. 
It's typically six times the full load amps of the motor, and it's going to be very quick. Uh, locked rotor is going to be if you have that six times the full load amps for a sustained amount of time, which is actually eight to 20 seconds. Uh, after eight to 20 seconds, the control panel will say that you have a locked rotor condition and it will shut it off because the pump is not turning, nothing is happening, uh, and you can cause more damage. So um, the locked rotor is the only way that you can stop an electric control panel. And it's got some adjustability there. The, there's variance with the eight to 20 seconds. And a lot of that, that has to do with how quickly the spike amp happens. And if it's at that 600%, it's going to be closer to eight. If it's uh, maybe around 300%, it's going to take more like 20 seconds. But if it has a sustained amount of high amperage, uh, it's going to be a lock rotor condition and it will shut the motor off. Uh, with a diesel, the only way to stop it is going to be overspeed. Um, and overspeed is going to be like a, a runaway engine. Um, I'm not really sure what causes that, but you can overpressurize a system and cause even more damage. So overspeed is the only way that we can actually stop a diesel fire pump. Uh, to get into some information about the location of the control panel, uh, it needs to be within sight of the fire pump and vice versa. So typically you're going to have a fire pump room and the fire pump and the fire pump controller are going to be put into the same room and you're going to have, you know, and it's very small. Uh, so you're going to it's not typically an issue that you can't see the pump from the control panel. But that is one of the uh, one of the, the location requirements is that you have to be able to see the control panel from the pump and you have to see the pump from the control panel. So you can't put them in two separate rooms. Um, controller shall be installed so that all load carrying components are 12 inches above floor. Um, that one has to do with basically where the first contact or, or where the first connection into the control panel is going to be. So. Uh, for our control panels, that's going to be into the motor contact. When you pull in the motor leads where those connect, that's going to be the bottom uh, of the load carrying components. So that's where you have to have that spot 12 inches above the floor. So it's not it's not necessarily the the bottom of the controller that has to be 12 inches above the floor. It's the load carrying components. So the control panel uh, can sit all the way on the ground as long as those components are 12 inches above the floor. And I'll show a picture later on. We've got a couple different uh, control panel box sizes. Our size one controller has legs on it. So it's uh, it's already lifted up that 12 inches. Our other con controllers are size two and up. It's actually a full cabinet. So you can sit that on the ground and we have uh, wire bending space inside the controller. Uh, but the bottom of the control panel can sit on the ground because the first load carrying component which is the motor contact, uh, is, is plenty of space up. It's 12 inches or, or beyond. I think it's actually 16 inches above the floor. So, um, so you're good putting those control panels on the ground. Uh, the controller should not be used as a junction box. So typically what you'll see with that is going to be a jockey panel trying to be powered off of the isolation switch main controller uh, because you have the power feed coming in there, and then they want to try and run the jockey off that same power but that's not allowed. You can't do that. Uh, you cannot use the controller as a junction box. So any of that, you know, if you've brought in too big of a wire size or something, it, it all has to be done outside of the controller. Um, the enclosure is standard as a uh, NEMA type two, which is actually drip proof. So that's just water falling from above. Um, it's not, necessarily being sprayed by a hose or, you know, a pipe bursting and, um, and flooding a room and that kind of stuff. So it's, it's basically just a drip from the top, which is important to note when, um, say, an electrical contractor wants to install the control panel and come in through the top and just pull the feed directly into the isolation switch instead of going up through the bottom. Um, and in that scenario, it needs to be made sure that the, the hub is watertight. So you have to have a NEMA 4 watertight hub if you're going to go through the top of the control panel, which is not recommended. I understand sometimes that is the only option. Um, and we have a letter actually that outlines how to do that properly. So if that scenario ever comes up, uh, just let me or somebody at Tornasec know uh, so we can kind of walk them through the proper way to, to do the penetration on the top of the control panel. But we would prefer people to come in through the bottom of the panel. Um, but anyway, if you do come through the top, it needs to be a watertight hub, uh, not NEMA 2, because if you do a NEMA 2 
hub on the top of the control panel, it's actually not watertight and you lose the NEMA 2 rating of the control panel. So that's an important note to make there. Uh, okay, so the pressure sensing assembly, this is our uh, test solenoid valve and where the transducer is. Uh, you pull your, uh, your sensing line into this. We actually have it mounted externally. It's not inside the control panel. Uh, we have what we call externally mounted wetted parts. Uh, so you just pull your, your, uh, your sensing line into the, uh, this uh, spot here. Uh, that's where you're gonna make the connection on the sensing line. And our transducer is inside of this as well as a, a test solenoid valve. So on the front of our control panels, there's a test button. Uh, and I'll show that, that in a little bit later as well. But when you push the test button, it will actually shoot out just a tiny, tiny bit. This is a three-way valve. So in between, uh, you're gonna have just a, a tiny little bit of water. And when you press the test button, it's gonna evacuate that water. It's mostly air actually, uh, and drop the pressure to zero right here at the solenoid uh, and right here at the pressure transducer. And it will run a test mode for 10 minutes for the electric, 30 minutes for the diesel. And uh, it's this little white piece right here that's where the uh, the water will evacuate. You can actually attach a little rubber hose to that as well if you want to you know, run that water to drain, but it's very little. So you might get just a couple little drops that come out when you push the test button. Some allowable starting modes. Uh, well, you have manual start, which is gonna be pushing the green button. So that's your manual start. Uh, and then you have an automatic start, which is gonna be the pressure drop. Uh, that's how the majority of these systems are set up is going to be uh, pressure actuated with uh, an automatic start so pressure actuated meaning that it's using a pressure transducer to sense the the system pressure when it drops below a cut endpoint, it's going to turn the pump on and start automatically and uh, that's what's called a pump on demand um, manual start just going up and pushing the green button uh, then you can also have a remote start station, uh, deluge valve, and emergency start. So emergency start is going to be something that's connected to the control panel as well. I, ours is down on the bottom right, and you pull it into place, and it, it pulls power in directly at the motor contact. So you're bypassing if you have a, a soft start or a Y delta or a part winding or any other kind of starting method. When you pull the emergency handle, it's going to be across the line. So you're just you're bypassing all the internals and pulling power in directly to the motor contacts is exactly what it sounds. It's for emergencies only. Some allowable stopping modes is going to be uh, the manual stop, which is just pushing the red button. Uh, and then you can also do an automatic stop or an automatic shutdown um, that has to be approved by an AHJ. Um, but basically the way that works is that you'd have a, uh, a 10 minute timer and uh, or however long you wanted the timer to be but the pump would come on with cut in so you drop below let's say 100 psi is your cut in point drop below 100 psi the pump is on demand the pressure has gone back up above your cut out point which let's say is 110 psi and if it stays above 110 psi for whatever the timer is set for our default is 10 minutes so if you stay above 110 psi for 10 minutes then the pump will shut off automatically if during that 10 minute timer, the pressure drops below the 110 PSI cut out point, it's going to reset the timer. And you go back to 10 minutes when the pressure gets back above 110. So it, it has to see a sustained, whatever your timer set for, uh, above the cutout point before it will do an automatic shutdown. But that's one of the options. So manual stop or an automatic shutdown. Uh, this is the run test button that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so on the front of our, our controllers, we have a green start button, a red stop button. Then we have this uh, test button, which is going to actuate that valve uh, that I was showing you earlier. And that will evacuate that tiny little bit of water uh, and run a manual run test. So when you do the manual run test, you're going to be uh, doing that. If it's an electric, it's going to be 10 minutes. Um, and if you're doing the diesel, it's going to be set for 30 minutes. So <clears throat> that's just a way to come up and push that automatically and start the test. It logs it as a test and uh, instead of logging it as a as an auto start. Basically, 
everybody has to test these. It's required for electrics to do um, a test once a month and diesels once a week. And uh, if you do it the way that I, I see the majority of people, it's fine. Uh, if you crack open a valve and you drop the pressure on the sensing line, uh, it logs, the controller will log it as an automatic start. It sees that as a pump on demand. It thinks there is a fire and it logs it as an auto start. If you push the button, it knows it's a test and it logs it as a test. So just for you know purposes of keeping track of the logs, I'd recommend using the run test button, um, but it's not necessary. You can do whatever way works for your, uh, your, your maintenance guys, but uh, that run test button is there to be used for that purpose. Um, the other option is to do it as a periodic test. Uh, it operates the same way as the manual run test, but you can program it to come on automatically every Monday at 8 a.m. Uh, you do have to be present inside the pump room when you're doing that. So uh, it's, you know, for me, I'd say it's better just to go ahead and push the manual run test just in case somebody misses their eight o'clock time on that Monday and then the pump is running by itself. Um, part of the code says that you have to be present when the fire pump is running for doing these test purposes. So something to keep in mind there. Um, all right, so now we'll move on to some of the types of fire pump controllers. We're gonna look at full service mainly. Um, there's a couple slides on limited service and I have no slides on these other types, but uh, we do offer variable speed, medium voltage and uh, residential control panels as well. So for full service, they are all uh, UL and FM approved. Uh, that is a requirement, we touched on that earlier. Uh, and they are three phase power only, single phase is not allowed. Uh, that's actually what the limited service is for. And there's no limitation on horsepower. So five horsepower and up. Uh, at some point, you know, the listings run out uh, for, uh, you know, for, for that because uh, we just don't have a listing for, uh, you know, a thousand horsepower or something like that on full service control panel. But um, the UL and FM approved, there's no limitation on horsepower. So we can go up to very high horsepowers. Uh, all control panel manufacturers are required to do a, uh, a voltmeter and an ammeter mounted on the front door. And uh, we have, this is a screenshot from what we call the VisiTouch. The VisiTouch is our operator. And uh, this is how we indicate the volts and the, uh, the amps. So on the left side, you'll see line one, line two, and line three. That's the L1, L2, and L3. And you can see that we're getting three different readings here. So we have 450 volts coming from line one to line three. And then we have 454 from line one to line two and 454 from line two to line three. Um, so these guys over here, that's your voltmeter. Then you have these three zero A's that are circles here. And I'm gonna circle the circles. That is your, uh, that's your ammeter. So this pump, is not running right now, which is why there's zero amps. Uh, the contacts that are next to them, you see those three sets of parallel lines. Um, that is uh, just indicating that the contacts are open right now. If the motor was running, the contacts would be closed and you would see this gap is filled. There'll be a little green box in there that shows that those contacts are closed. The motor will be green and you'll have some amps in, these, uh, in the ammeter. Okay, so for full service, the short circuit withstand rating, the industry standard is 100,000 amps, which is typically more than uh, ample uh, amount of, uh, uh, of protection there. Some people will ask for 150 or 200,000, which is fine, we can do that as well. Uh, but 100,000 is, uh, is the industry standard and that covers you know, the majority of it, it's 95%. I, I'm just kind of throwing out a number there, but the majority of it is gonna be 100,000. Um, and then you have a couple different starting methods. You have across the line, which is the one that's just going to be full voltage uh, straight off. Whenever you hit the start button, it's just going as fast as it can. Or you can do a reduced voltage start. So once you get into the higher horsepowers um, and, and that area depends or that, that depends on the area of different markets are different. Uh, but, you know, you'll, you'll start getting into soft starts, uh, wide delta open, wide delta close, part windings. Uh, and stuff like that. So all of those are considered reduced voltage because it's not across the line. 
Uh, I mentioned earlier the lock rotor protection. So full service control panels have lock rotor protection. Uh, they have a magnetic only breaker and it's where you get the lock rotor protection. So it's set for six times the full load amperage. That's uh, also known as the FLA or the FLC. Uh, it's factory set and is not adjustable in the field. Uh, so, and as I mentioned before, it's set to trip open between eight to 20 seconds. Uh, the emergency start mechanism, as I mentioned that before, that's at the bottom right of ours. Ours is a pull out. Some people have a push in or a push down, um, but that's gonna be across the line. Even if you have a reduced voltage starting method, when you pull that handle, it's gonna be across the line. So when you have a 500 horsepower soft start and you're doing the startup and you have to do that emergency handle, you're pulling those big, those big motors uh, across the line. You're pulling it to full voltage immediately. Um, so full service, we have a single operator for on off. So that's gonna be this little guy right here. That's our, uh, that's our operator. Right now it's in the on position. Um, you push it all the way down to turn it off. And actually there's a, uh, for our control panels, uh, there's a door defeater is what we call that. There's a little plastic piece that even when it's in the off position and you unlock the, uh, the other spots, we, we have a keyed lock and then we have two that you can open with like a, a flathead screwdriver or a, or a quarter or something like that. Um, but even with all three of those, uh, unlocked and turned and it in the off position, the door doesn't open. It does not swing open. There's a, a door defeater on there. So you take our, uh, our operator and push it down just a little bit further. So when you push it down, the door defeater pops up and the door will open at that point. Um, some of the visual indications that uh, we have to have. We have to show power available. We have to show motor run, and then we also have to show if there is a phase reversal. So that phase reversal is not something that's happening at a normal time, but if it happens, we have to have an indication for phase reversal. So on this screen, the way that we show power is available is with the uh, with these guys. That's going to be the uh, the voltmeter. So the voltmeter is uh is what's showing us that power is available if power power was was bad um it wouldn't be green it would be yellow if it's just in a slight under voltage condition or it would be uh red if you've got 208 volt coming into this control panel which is actually set to be 480 so uh power available is indicated with the uh the voltmeters motor run we indicate that in a lot of different ways uh you can you can look at that on the amps and uh, you can look at that by the fact that the contacts are closed, the motor is green. Uh, over here on the right side, you'll see a triangle that's showing that it's a, it's a delta start and it was a manual start. So we're indicating that the motor is running in a, in a lot of different ways. Um, where it says manual right here, that's going to be uh, indicating how the control panel was started. Uh, if you push the green button, it's going to show as a manual start. If you push the uh, or you pull the emergency handle, it's going to show emergency. If it's an auto start, it says auto. Um, we also have to show if the control panel is in automatic or non-automatic mode. The majority of it's going to be automatic. If it's a not automatic, the control panel only works in a manual mode. So you'd have to always come up and push the start panel or the start button to start it. Uh, we have to show the type of actuation, whether it's pressure or non-pressure. Uh, again, the majority of it's going to be pressure, but you can also have a foam system that is non-pressure actuated. It could be indicated by, uh, you know, a flame detector or something like that. Uh, we just, you know, would need an on-off indication just to tell us it's time to send the foam or whatever. So that would be a non-pressure system. Um, type of shutdown, the manual or automatic that we've discussed as well. Uh, there's three contacts that are required. Um, by code, we have to have power available, motor run, and phase reversal. So these are for remote alarm enunciation. Uh, those three are already programmed in the control panel. So you've got power available on the top, motor run, and phase reversal. And then our control panels come with three extras that can be programmed in the field uh, to do whatever. You can have a double power available if you want to. Um, but that's uh, actually all of these contacts are double, double pull, double throw. So you already have that avail uh, availability to duplicate that. But if you need even more uh, contacts, we already have three extras. Uh, and then we can expand that to however many are required. OK, 
Okay, so to look at the external uh, part of our control panel, I mentioned before that we have a couple different sizes. This is what would be considered a size one, and I know that because of the fact that it has these legs on it. Um, if it was a size two or up, there's no legs. And I, I think there's a picture of that in this presentation as well, where it shows the full cabinet. Uh, but anyway, this one comes with legs. We have our alarm bell uh, at the top, which is like 95 decibels. It's very loud. That's our uh, that's our audible indicator is we use the, uh, the bell, not like a chirper or an alarm, but we use an alarm bell. Um, then we have our externally mounted wetted parts over here that we, uh, we looked at earlier up close. The VisiTouch. Uh, that's the screen here. The VisiTouch is our um, that's our main operator. That's computer. That's the brain of the system. Uh, every control panel comes with these lifting lugs on top. And uh, as I mentioned before, we have these uh, keyed lock systems as well. So we can um, we can keep you can lock the controller, which, by the way, no control panel comes locked. Uh, I think that's something that uh, that's that's happened before where somebody gets to the control panel and the key is on the inside. So they don't come locked, the key is on the inside, and then somebody takes the keys, they lock it, they walk away with keys, and then somebody says that the control panel is locked and nobody can find a way in. But um, those keys are not control panel specific, they can be used on any of them. So if you use a lot of our control panels and you have one key, just keep it with you and you'll be able to open up the controller. So that's, uh, that's, that's good to know. Oh, and also on the outside of our control panels, you, we have, this exterior uh, USB port, uh, that's for downloading logs and, um, you know, diagnostic purposes. We, we might ask somebody to send us logs uh, so that we can take a look at what the controller has been doing. If you've been getting um, some starts that uh, are unexplainable, uh, we can always take a look at the logs. So um, the external USB is right on the front. There's, there's also one on the inside, on the back side. So we have two, two ways that you can download logs. Uh, on the inside, on the top left, we're going to have our removable alarm contact terminals. Um, that's going to be those that power run, phase reversal, those guys that we mentioned earlier. Um, they're going to be on the top left, and they are they're, they're pulled apart because, you know, getting in these panels can be a little tight. So you pull them off, you can wire them, and then you just click them back in. Uh, then we have the surge arrestor um, up on the top, this area right here. That's your isolation switch. So... This is where the power comes in. That's where the power feed needs to go. Uh, the power feed does not go here. That is your motor contact. So uh, you, you don't want to put the power there. I have seen that happen. I'm sure other people have seen that happen before. But uh, the preferred way that we would like the control panel to be wired would be uh, through this gland plate that you can see here. So that gland plate is at the bottom of all of our control panels. Uh, it's removable with four screws. Uh, you can drill it, uh, leave a big hole. You can actually just remove it and leave it off because the control panel is NEMA 2. And as I mentioned before, that's drip proof. So that's from falling water from above. Um, taking the bottom off the control panel does not affect the NEMA 2 rating. So you can just remove that if you want to or cut a hole and seal it back up. But come in through the bottom and you'll wrap the controller. I wrap the wires. Let me get rid of some of these things. So come up and then take your power straight into the isolation switch like that. And same thing for the motor contact. Just come straight into the motor contactor. Um, if you have to penetrate through the top of the panel, like I said before, there is a there is a way to do that. The important thing is to cover all of the components and the inside and make sure no drill shavings uh, get on any components. And again, you got to have that NEMA 4 uh, watertight hub on the top because um, there's two things that can kill a control panel very quickly, and it's going to be the metal shavings uh, getting in somewhere uh, that it shouldn't be causing a short, or water. Uh, water and electricity don't really go together very well. They, uh, they, they cause a lot of problems when that happens. So it's best to just go through the bottom and try to avoid as much uh, unnecessary issues as possible. Um, bottom right here, this is our emergency handle that I mentioned. That's uh, that's going to be the pull mechanism, and uh, that's like I said, you're just you're bypassing everything. That makes it an across the line start. Um, if the control panel has a transfer switch, uh, it's the automatic power transfer switch. It's uh, it says that it's required if normal utility power is not reliable. 
And, um, and I, I think that also is going to vary uh, depending on what area you're living in, uh, whether or not they see that as uh, their utility is not reliable. And I don't know what that percentage is, 99% of the time, I, I would assume uh, everything is fine. I don't know. But if normal utility power is not reliable, um, you need to have a transfer switch. Uh, it has to be housed in a barriered compartment or in a separate enclosure attached to the fire pump controller, which is how we have it set up. It's uh, the control panel when it has a transfer switch on it. Oh, I thought I had a picture next. I'll get to that in a second. Uh, you have the normal side of the control panel and then you'll have a transfer switch. So there's two separate doors and there's a barrier in between. Uh, if your controller has the transfer switch, you're gonna have a fourth button which is the automatic power transfer switch test button. Um, the, the transfer switches are listed and approved for fire service. And then we have this test button. Uh, basically that test button is just for testing purposes. It's not meant to be used when you're doing the 150% flow and then having to switch it over to emergency power. Uh, the button actually won't do anything if you push it, nothing will happen. Um, that button is only for uh, for testing. So if you push it, it's going to send a signal to turn on the generator. Uh, the generator will kick on once power is uh, all the way up, takes, you know, I don't, however long it takes the generator to, to boot up. Um, but once you get to the proper voltage, then the transfer switch will switch over and it'll stay there for five minutes running the test. Then it will switch back to normal, tell the generator to turn off and the generator might run for you know, 30 minutes if it has a cool down cycle or something like that. But um, that's the purpose of the button. Uh, if you're doing that 150% flow, uh, the best thing to do instead of pushing the button because it doesn't do anything is to kill power. So pull that isolation switch down or the, the operator down uh, and kill normal power, leaving your transfer switch power on and it will switch, it'll switch over. So that's, that's simulating a true power failure. And uh, that's how we, we would recommend doing that test. Um, some of the contacts for remote alarm enunciation on a transfer switch is gonna be the isolating switch uh, in the off position, and transfer switch in normal position, transfer switch in alternate emergency position. So we have to keep track of uh, the, the transfer switch being powered on. If the isolation switch is in the off position, it's not automatic at that point, it would be a manual transfer switch. So you have to leave it in the on position so that um, so that if a power failure happens, the control panel can switch over to um, to the alternate side. Um, so we have to have an alarm for that. The transfer switch in normal position is just if it's not in the uh, the alternate side, then it's not working um, automatically again, or if it's not in the auto uh, position. Okay, so this is the outside of the controller with the transfer switch. Everything is the same. We got the same bell, the same uh, externally mounted wetted parts, the same busy touch, same operator. All Everything is built the same, except now we have this second uh, little cabinet here, and that's gonna be what houses the transfer switch. Uh, and you can see there's no screen or anything there. Everything is done on the busy touch. So we're gonna be monitoring the transfer switch from the busy touch um, and all of its operation from there as well. Also a note is that this is our size two controller or three, I don't know, this is a this is a bigger one. It's not the size one. Size one's the only one that has the legs. This one has uh, that space built into the bottom. Um, and we'll just, I'll, I'll mention again, as far as installing these, because that comes up a lot, is um, if you can't go in through the bottom of the controller here, if that's an issue just because of the fact that um, that it's already been set, and the conduit's not underneath it. You can come in through the bottom, you know, uh, maybe the bottom left, bottom right. Uh, that would be an, a, 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 an acceptable alternate to going in through the bottom. That's better than coming through the top. Top is again, that's last, last resort and um, only if, well, last resort, only if you have no other choice. So uh, we prefer bottom. Um, okay, so we have the same removable alarm contact terminals inside. We have a surge arrestor. It's, it's almost uh, a sort of a mirror image. You've got a circuit breaker, isolation switch assembly, just like you have on the normal side. Uh, obviously the transfer switch, that's a new component because that's where it's gonna be switching from your normal power 
to your alternate power so that you still have a flow of electricity into your control panel. So that's everything for full service. Uh, limited service is, uh, we've only got a couple slides on this. Uh, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's for limited service purposes. Um, you can have a uh, single phase here. It's only up to 30 horsepower and every starting method is across the line. So you only have that option. So you can do single phase, you can do up to 30 horsepower, um, but it's only UL listed and it has to be approved by an AHJ. So FM does not give any approvals on these um, and every installation needs to be uh, needs to be approved by the AHJ. And there we go. I already talked about that. OK, so that's it. That's it for the electrics. We're going to move over into the diesels now. Um, so we have two different options for diesels. Uh, the primary or the, the main ones are going to be the 12 volt. We see more 12 volt than we do 24, but uh, 24 is out there. We do plenty of 24 volts as well. Uh, but basically, just the way that those operate, they're operating off of the uh, the batteries, the engine batteries. Our control panel is operating off the engine batteries. Uh, we provide single phase power to the batteries. So we're doing a charge, uh, either a bulk charge or a trickle charge, depending on the voltage of the batteries uh, at the time of it needing to be charged. Trickle is, is better. If you're doing a constant bulk charging, you're going to burn up the batteries uh, or not the batteries, you're going to burn up the battery chargers and there's probably something wrong with your battery. So if uh, if you're burning through a lot of, uh, you know, the battery chargers there, you, you need to be looking more at the batteries than you do at the, the control panel. So typically that's, uh, you know, the, the life of the battery is it's only so long. Um, so anyway, you've got uh, 12 volt or 24. Uh, we're providing the, the single phase power to the batteries and then we are powered by the batteries. So if you ever lose power, uh, that single phase power is gone, the control panel is still going to be operational because it's going to be operating off the batteries. So as long as the batteries have a charge, the control panel, the system, everything is good. And there's two individual battery chargers. So you have two battery banks. You've got, uh, you know, you've got one charger from one battery bank and then you've got another charger for a separate battery bank. A little redundancy there. Um, the, the diesels have an HOA, the handoff auto selector switch uh, behind what is a lockable but breakable cover. So we have this uh, plastic piece. It's actually a little bit different now, um, but basically it's the same concept. So it's just a plastic piece that, uh, that covers up the HOA. So you can also put a padlock down there, uh, which makes it lockable, but then it's made of plastic. So it's also breakable in the case of emergency. You can just rip it off. Um, and you have to have individual two crank uh, push buttons. So this is the, these are used for your manual starts. If you crank number one, that's pulling from one battery set. And crank number two, that's going to pull from your second battery bank. Um, and if you push number one and two together, it's going to be using both battery sets, both battery banks to uh, to start the engine. So if you have a 12 volt system and your batteries are both at six, one is not going to be strong enough to do it. And two is not going to be strong enough to do it, but one and two together, uh, hopefully will give you enough power to get the engine started. So uh, that's when you could use that scenario. Uh, and then also we're supposed to have a seven day pressure recorder. Again, this stuff is general to everybody in the, uh, in the industry that's making control panels, but a seven day pressure recorder for us um, is, is not a big deal. We store everything in the busy touch. So we're keeping track of the pressure, uh, for an electric, we're looking at the amps, the voltage. We're, we're keeping track of everything that the control panel does. But seven day pressure recorder, we're, we're definitely doing that. It's uh, basically lifetime of the system for us. Um, we have to have an audible alarm. I showed earlier a picture. We have, uh, we have this alarm bell that is very loud. You can definitely hear it over an engine. And through your earplugs, it's, it's loud. It's, it penetrates earplugs. Um, we're also supposed to show visual indications. Um, we have to show all of these, uh, and it's always on the busy touch battery voltage, battery amperage, uh, you know, so on and so forth. I don't want to have to read all of these things that's, that gets boring, but um, there's a lot of different visual indications that we have to keep track of on the, on the diesel. 
Uh, and then we have to have, just like in the electric, we have to have contacts for remote alarm enunciation. Um, we already have five for this one that are dedicated. Uh, so you still get the six bonus that can be used for whatever you want to. Uh, but five of them have already been used. And uh, if you need, again, if you need more, uh, we can always expand that and, um, and add a lot more alarm, uh, uh, alarm contacts. But engine run, common controller trouble, that's a, that's a group of different, uh, different uh, alarms. Uh, selector switch in the off or hand, obviously you want it to be an auto or it's not going to be an automatic system. Um, common engine trouble, again, that's a group of alarms and common pump room alarm. That's a, another group of alarms. So they, uh, these cover a lot of different alarms that could possibly go on in a uh, diesel engine. Um, so for the alarm and shutdown schedule, look at this, uh, this graph here. I mentioned earlier that uh, there's that test solenoid button. And if you push that button on the front, the test button, it's gonna log it as a run test. And that's true for the electric and for the diesel. So if you push it on the diesel, it, it's doing a run test. If you open up a valve, uh, it's going to be doing it as an automatic start. So opening a valve, draining the pressure. The control panel is smart, but it's not smart enough to know that you're doing that. So it thinks that there's a fire. And so when you look at this alarm and shutdown schedule, you can see if you do an automatic start and you have high coolant in your engine or low oil pressure, it's only going to alarm. Um, and the same thing if you do a manual start or a remote start it thinks that there's a fire. So it's only going to alarm in these scenarios. If you push the test button, it knows you're doing a test and therefore it does not need to run until failure. Because if you remember at the beginning of this uh, presentation, I mentioned uh, that we are here to protect life and property, not the equipment. So with that being said, the equipment, if it thinks there's a fire, it's going to continue to run until it can't run any longer. If you're doing a test, it will shut down because it knows there's not a fire. So that's why one of the reasons, especially with the diesel, I recommend pushing that button uh, just so that you have a little added protection just in case something goes wrong with the engine. Um, however, with overspeed, you can see down here, overspeed, like I said, that's the only thing that we can shut down a control panel for or shut down a diesel engine is, uh, is overspeed. So no matter what the start method is, if the engine ends up into some sort of overspeed um, it will shut down. Uh, okay, so external on the diesel fire pump controller, uh, a lot of the same components that you're going to see on the electric, same bell, same externally mounted wetted part, same busy touch, just uh, different software, uh, a couple different buttons because you get the one and two, but basically it's the same setup. Um, then you have the added HOA, still a key lock system and this one is the one I mentioned before that you can use um, a flathead screwdriver or a quarter or you know something something flat and small that can turn uh, and then the, the, the typically with the diesels um, people wall mount them because they're very small it's kind of they're bigger than a jockey but they're not a whole lot bigger than a jockey uh, so typically they're just wall mounted there is an available pedestal stand that you can uh, put these on as well, but as standard, they don't come with the stand. So they're, they're meant to be wall mounted. So they all come with the, uh, the wall mount. If you need to set it in the middle of a room or something, like I said, we have a stand. That's just, uh, that's an option. Inside the controller is very simple. We have uh, similar alarm contacts like in the electrics, um, but then you have the battery chargers. Uh, an EMI filter, you got the AC and DC uh, circuit breakers there for your chargers, and uh, this is the back side of the VisiTouch here. And then down on the bottom, this is where you make all of your engine connections down here. Um, also has this clamp plate, just like the electrics. So, you know, same thing here. We prefer everybody to come in through the bottom, come through that gland plate, um, and make all of your connections there. So you just have the, uh, the, the connection strip down at the bottom. So very easy to access. Um, so that's it for the diesel. And now we'll, uh, we'll finish up with some jockeys. Uh, the jockey controller is, uh, it's not actually considered a fire pump controller. Um, it's UL 508. So that's, uh, that's an industrial 
um, an industrial listing um, not listed for fire. So it's a red box because it's, uh, you know, it's a complementary product to the, uh, the fire pump controller, but it is not actually uh, considered a fire pump controller, just an industrial one. So it's a, it's a pressure maintenance system more than it is, uh, you know, fire prevention system. Um, basically, I just said this, but required to start and stop a pressure maintenance pump. Uh, jockey pump in order to maintain the sprinkler system pressure. So all the jockey is trying to do is is maintain that pressure. It's typically set, you know, 10, 15, 20 PSI, however many PSI above your cut in point for the, or actually your cut out point. You're going to want it set a lot higher than, or not a lot higher, but, uh, you know, 10 PSI or whatever uh, above your, uh, your main controller um, because you want the jockey to be coming on first, maintaining the pressure. And uh, that way the main controller doesn't ever turn the, the fire pump on because when the fire pump comes on, the fire department gets there and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it's uh, it's more involved. The jockey controller is uh, is really kind of the workhorse in the system unless there's a fire or a huge leak in the system that the jockey can't keep up with. So if you have a very leaky system and the jockey is just not being able to maintain the pressure, you, you might get some you know false starts on your uh on your on your main fire pump but um it's actually got an automatic stop too that was a uh, something that i wanted to mention that the jockeys you know with the uh with the main controller you have to have the the automatic stop is you know it's uh it's got to be approved by the ahj uh with the jockey controller it's not it doesn't have to be approved it's just the way it is uh that's the nature of the jockey so you automatically start and you automatically stop just to try and maintain the pressure Uh, the outside of the jockey, this is uh, the main disconnect here. We have uh, a digital display. This is what we call the IPD plus operator. Uh, again, it's meant to be wall mounted uh, and is a type two controller, just like the um, just like the, the main controllers, the diesel and the electric. Um, I will point out a couple things on our diesel. I mean, not our diesel, I'm sorry, on our jockey panels that are uh, probably different than some of the other guys. Uh, this is a digital display right here. So that's where you're gonna see the pressure reading in the system. So whatever the system pressure is, that's what's gonna be on that screen there. Next to that, this uh, it's kind of hard to see, but there are three dots. There's three LED dots uh, right over here in this area. And that's gonna indicate where the uh, where the pressure is according to your set points. So at the very top, it's going to be green. If it's green, it means that it was uh, that it's above the uh, the cutout point. If it's yellow, if the yellow indicator, which is the second one down, uh, if that one is on, that means that you're in between the cut in and the cut out. Uh, and then if it's red, which is the third dot on the bottom, it means that you're below the cut in. Uh, and at that point, the motor. Uh, for the jockey should be on, the jockey pump should be turning, and uh, it would have been an automatic start. And below that, this little section here is going to show, there's going to be this one on the left side, uh, it's going to be hand, and on the right side is auto. Uh, basically, those indicator lights are off all the time. Uh, but the panel is set to be automatic as long as you have your cut in and cut out set uh, and the control panel is operational. It's going to be in automatic mode automatically. And so when there's a pressure drop and it starts with uh, an auto start, that light on the right side will show it'll it'll turn on and it'll indicate that it was an auto start. If you push the green button, uh, the hand button will pop on. It'll turn uh, it'll turn green and it'll show that uh, it's being operated in hand. So just a manual start. Uh, on the inside of the controller, very simple here. Um, this is your main disconnect switch. You have uh, fuses next to that, and that's what these are, the fuses. Uh, then you have a transformer next to that. Uh, down here, Okay, so the, the disconnect, this is where your power goes. Uh, I have seen a couple times, and I'm sure somebody on this uh, webinar here has seen this as well, where somebody has brought in power uh, to either the motor contactor or the overload, but that is not correct. So obviously you wanna put your power to the, uh, the disconnect switch 
and uh, run your motor into the, the motor contactor. So don't put your motor leads into the overload either. Please put them into the contactor. Um, but uh, then this is your transducer down here. Jockeys are very simple. There's not a whole lot to them. Um, very, very easy little guys. But uh, that's it for the presentation. Uh, we covered the electrics and the diesels and the jockeys. Uh, if there's any questions about anything, uh, we're going to have a Q&A to follow this presentation. So uh, feel free to ask anything uh, that comes to mind. And thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed the presentation. Uh, now let's get started with the question and answer period. So here is our first question. What are the main differences between NEC and CEC in terms of fire pump control installation? Um, well, I, I don't know them. I, I don't know CEC all that well. Um, I'm assuming you mean the Canadian Electric Code. But uh, just from what I understand, NEC is uh, what well, we need like 30 inches uh, in width and 36 inches in depth. I think that's right. And I believe the CEC is more like a meter square or something like that as far as the installation. Well, at least as far as the working conditions and being installed. But again, I don't I don't know the CEC all that well. NEC is what we're going by. OK. Uh, our next question is, can phase reversal be tested through the Visi touch to simulate a phase reversal condition? Yes, yeah, it can. Uh, all of our alarms can be tested. So the way that it does a phase reversal test, it's not really, it's not showing a phase reversal. We're not, we're not, uh, you know, causing any issues with the uh, with the actual power feed or anything like that. But uh, you can you can go to the alarms that are through the Visi touch, and you can tell it to start a test, and all that's doing is closing the contact. Uh, that would be enunciating that there is a phase reversal. So you can confirm that the alarm is set up and the screen will show that it's doing a test on the phase reversal. But all of our alarms are, are able to be tested, including phase reversal. Okay. Uh, next one, does it has to be set of contacts on the transfer switch side to start the generator and alarm contact to tell the fire alarm panel that the fire pump controller is uh, on alternate power? Yes, that is correct. There is, uh, yeah, we, we have to send a signal to the generator to tell it to start that there's a demand that it needs to be coming on. Uh, and then once uh, once it makes that transfer over, that's one of those alarms on the uh, on the alternate side that we're keeping track of. So uh, the position of the of the um, of the alternate power. So as soon as it gets switched over to alternate, it, it sends a signal, sends an alarm saying that it's on that. So, yeah, we are keeping track of all, all that. And the next one, are there alternate type of batteries other than lead acid accepted and listed? Um, that I, I don't really know. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not 100% on that. The only batteries I've ever seen have been, you know, your standard like uh, car type batteries, the truck batteries, that kind. So I don't I don't know if there's any other ones like lithium ion or something like that. I've never seen that. That would be neat. Um, but as far as I know, the, the lead acid, that's uh, that's all we have. Okay. Got a pump. One of the pump people probably knows that better than I do because we don't we don't supply the batteries we just charge them. Cool. Um, and the next one is: Is it possible to change a diesel fire diesel fire pump controller from twelve voltage to twenty four voltage in the field? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, it is an option uh, that we can do that. But the way that we have to do that is going to be with changing out the battery chargers. So. Our chargers are specific to 12 volt or 24 volt. So in order to do that in the field, we would have to we'd have to swap out the chargers and then do a software update so that the uh, the controller knows, you know, what what type of uh, batteries we have. So it is possible, but it's not uh, it's not the easiest thing. OK, um, the next is other than the USB port, what are the other methods to extract data from controller? Um, well, that's the only way. That's the only way we can do it. We we are uh, we, we have an app, uh, but it's not really ready just yet. We're still doing some final testing on that, and I think eventually that will be the way that you can do it as well. Um, but right now, the USB is the way that we uh, we extract the information. You can access a lot of the logs just right there on the screen, uh, so you can look at all the stuff that you can download. Which you can look at the the power curves, you can look at the pressure curves, you can look at all the events. Uh, and there's even a way to filter out specific 
uh, events based on date on Visi Touch. So there's ways that you can do it on screen, but as far as getting it off, look at it on a computer, the USB is the only way to do that. Okay. Um, do fire pump controllers with the transfer switch have an emergency start button? Um, an emergency start button on the transfer switch. Uh, let's see. I, I don't. There's there's the there's the test button on the transfer switch, and you can you can operate it manually. Um, but there, as far as there being like an emergency button on the transfer switch side, no. The, the emergency handle is still, as far as starting, is is still on the normal power side. But if you are all if you're on alternate power and you pull the power, the the emergency handle is still going to be using that alternate power. Uh, but there's not like a specific start on that side. Everything is still done from the, the normal side. Okay. And our next one, can we get a copy of the presentation by email? I think I can answer that one. Yeah, um, yeah we can do that. Yes. Let me go back real quick to the, the USB port to extract that. We have Modbus TCP IP. That is a standard. Uh, so that's that's already built into the controller if you can extract information that way. So there is something other than USB. We have Modbus. And the next one, if we can send a presentation via email, yes, definitely we can. But also this presentation will be available on demand soon. And you can check on our website and even um, on social media too. And our next one is, um, do you have a more advanced training that gets into the programming and troubleshooting of the panel? Uh, yeah, yeah, we we uh, we've done one that's that's more advanced than the 101. It's uh, more specific on the GPX, uh, which is our electric line, and GPD, which is the diesel line, uh, and it, it has a lot more detail, specific information on the control panels and how they're built. Um, and then we have to do a separate one on the Visi Touch, and we have done those as well. And I think they're both up on the website that are on demand, um, so they should be there available. But the Visi Touch is the one that we have for you know, as far as looking at the operator and the programming and all of that. Okay. And next question is, load carrying components are required to be 12 above the floor. It is recommended for wiring and distribution panel feeding. The controller also be 12 above the floor? Uh, no, it's the, the load carrying component. It, uh, it doesn't have to do with the wiring, even though they are carrying a load, but that's not what the, the it's specifically about the connection point. So that connection point is 12 inches above the ground. So the wires can be hanging below that, um, but it's where it's connected into the motor contactor. So that's our lowest point. That's where that part has to be 12 inches above the ground. So it's not specifically about the wires. Okay. Uh, when would you specify a diesel fire pump controller over an electric fire pump controller? Oh, I, I think that, that that's gonna vary. Um, I would imagine it has to do with your power is not reliable enough um, or the horsepower is really high and uh, the electric would be too much of a load on the system um, or you're in somewhere very remote um, and you need to go with diesel because you don't. Again, I think it would come down to not having the right power required. Okay. So with that presentation, are we authorized to make a fire control panel startup? No, that, this one, this the controller 101 is just a very introductory type deal. It's not meant to authorize anybody to work on our control panels. We have, uh, well, back when, uh, before COVID, we would do, um, you know, in-person trainings and, and that's how we would get the authorization to do that. That's a full day class where we have to go over the operator and look at the internals of the controller. It's hard to do that kind of stuff um, through a webinar in the brief amount of time that we have. So in order to do something like that, it's uh, it's more involved training. Okay, uh, our next one is the diesel controllers. Does Tonatec require automotive, uh, automotive type wire connectors to make a terminator at the controller? Uh, do we require that? Uh, I, I don't know if it's a require. I, I mean, we make those, those connectors are there um, and they are automotive type. I think it's just more out of the simplicity. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's what we have on the diesel side. It's just the, the system that people are familiar with. I, I don't I don't know the specifics on that. I'm sorry I can't answer that one all that well. Okay. Um, can I change the incoming AC voltage in the field? Example, instead of 120 voltage, need 220 voltage VAC. Uh, on the diesel, yeah, sure, you can. 
you can make some modifications. You're just changing out the transformer. Uh, our next one is: Will you be offering that training again soon? Um, on the the I guess the startup training and stuff like that. That's I, I hope so, but I don't I don't know I don't know. I mean, because we do that stuff in Canada, and so it's going to depend on the the COVID rules in Canada. And our next one is: How can we sign up for the fire panel startup training to get authorized to do the startup? There's a lot of people interested in that. I guess we need to. Uh, we'll have to discuss that um, internally. I'm not really sure. I don't know what the future holds as far as that goes, but uh, I certainly hope we get we get back to doing that soon. Okay. Um, the next one is what would the presentation. Um, no, with that presentation, are we authorized to make the yeah, fire? The same, the same question. We'll, so, we'll have to we'll have to address that. I, I mean, we'll have to talk about it. I, th this presentation is not it's not meant to authorize anybody to do startups. We didn't we didn't even really get into the busy touch and the programming and all of that. This is just general information. Okay, I think that's all. We can wait a few more seconds if anybody has a question. Before we end, I think that's all. Okay. So that's all the time we have for today. Uh, thank you so much, Cole, for that great presentation. Thank you, everyone, for attending our webinar. Please note that this webinar will also be available on demand. We really appreciate your feedback on how we did today. So please fill out the survey that will pop up at the end of this webinar. We can't wait to see you at the next one. Thank you. Bye, everyone.